Okay, um, everybody, it's good to see you. Um, for those of you who haven't been to previous Amhaskala events, uh, my name is Armin. Um, I'm, I guess I'm the community's rabbi. <laughs> and um, this today's session is part of a larger series of adult ed events. The, the past year, we've been looking at uh, figures, uh, persons in American Jewish history whose influence uh, was definitely in, uh, relevant and who left a mark on uh, American and global Jewish history, but who are unfortunately very often not so known or whose lives and legacy is uh, less known than the life and lives and legacy of other figures in American Jewish history. And today uh, I have the pleasure to lead a discussion on Henrietta Sold's um, biography. And we are gonna look at some of her speeches and letters and statements to get a better picture of what she, she stood for. Um, let us begin. Can you please nod? If you can see my screen. Okay, great. Um, Henrietta Sold. At the beginning, we are gonna uh, look at her early life and family background. We are gonna clarify how to pronounce her last name because I heard at least three different versions of pronouncing her last name, but there is only one. Um, we are gonna look at the career of uh, uh, Henrietta in the US, how she got involved in Zionist activities while being in the US and how the Zionist involvement eventually um, made her move and immigrate to mandatory Palestine. And finally, we are gonna look at her involvement in peace advocacy, as you're gonna find out. So, I mean, Sol is mainly famous for, um, this is something that you all know, I assume for establishing the Hadassah medical organization, but besides she was also very much invested in a Jewish Palestinian coexistence. And this is something we are gonna review towards the end of our session. But first, as promised, we are gonna take a look at her early life and background. So Henrietta Sold was born in 1860 in Baltimore. Um, her parents immigrated from Hungary in, in 1859. Um, her father was uh, Benjamin Sold, um, and a Hungarian rabbi who belonged to, um, in, in the US, people call it conservative movement. Back then, the movement as such did not exist yet, but belonged to uh, a movement of uh, rabbis who were open to biblical criticism, who were open to a scientific study of Judaism, but were more, more or less halakhically observant, which was a huge difference to reform Judaism, which neglected halakhic observance already back in the 1850s, um, but shared uh, these rabbis' commitment to a biblical and historical criticism of Jewish texts. Now, the movement back then was known as Positive Historical School. Um, many of the rabbis who were involved with the Positive Historical School movement, which originated from uh, uh, Eastern Germany, uh, Berlin mostly, and Breslau, uh, were later founders of the conservative movement. But at this point, the conservative movement did not exist yet as we understand it today. But these are basically the intellectual predecessors of the conservative movement. So that's, that's why all this information about uh, the positive historical school and what they stood for. And the solution to my, my question before how to pronounce the last name is sold, uh, as if it was written with an S. In Hungarian, S and Z together are to be pronounced as S. And very often I hear people pronounce her last name as Scholt, which would be the Polish pronunciation in Polish, namely S and Z are Esh, 
but in Hungarian it's the opposite, it's S. So now we clarify that. Um, Benjamin Salt's life itself is extremely exciting. He took over um, a mainstream reform German-speaking community in Baltimore called Temple Ohev Shalom. Um, and the, the, the congregation was using a reform siddur, which omitted all the references to Israel, to the Jewish people, Jewish uh, uh, particularism. And um, these were all concepts which uh, did not resonate with Salt, with Benjamin Salt. So he actually introduced a new siddur uh, in Temple of Shalom under the name Minhag Ashkenaz. Now Ashkenaz, as you know, is an identity marker for many Jews, but literally it means Germany in Hebrew. So it, the community was praying out of a new siddur called the Custom of Germany, Minhag Ashkenaz, um, which was a, Ger a Hebrew German siddur, and that was the siddur that uh, Temple of Shalom used after Benjamin Salt arrived. Uh, you can also see. see not the Sidor itself, but a publication by Benjamin Sold in German on the right side, published in Baltimore. Um, as you might know, at this point in American uh, Jewish history, uh, a large number of Jews in the country are German-speaking immigrants, recent immigrants who arrived in the US mostly after the 1840s. Um, many of these German Jews were convinced liberals who were abolitionists and believed in uh, universal freedom and issues like that, which is partially the reason why they left the German states uh, back in the 1840s. Uh, the German states were still ruled by uh, princes and kings and all kinds of different authoritarian or semi-authoritarian systems, um, which made many of these liberal Jewish uh, intellectuals and thinkers leave the, these central European countries and states um, and resettle in the US where of course there are also many issues, uh, but different kinds of issues, I guess. Now, apart from the father, who, um, her, her mother was called Sophie Schar. Uh, I don't know much about her, I have to admit, but apart from uh, Benjamin Sold, uh, I wanted to mention a few other members of Sold's of Henrietta Sol's family, who are who can be interesting for us. Her sister, Adele, uh, was a translator. And I don't know if anyone here knows Maya Debi. Well, uh, when, when I read that the, her sister was a translator of Maya Debi, I was very excited because I grew up on Maya Debi. It's a very popular uh, children's fable back in Europe. Um, and apparently, the American version was translated by Henrietta Sol's sister. So now we know. And it's not only Adel Seltzer who um, left her mark on history, but also Henrietta Sol's other sister, Bertha Sol Levin, who was an educator, just like Henrietta Sol, and also the first woman to serve on the Baltimore City School Board. And I also wanted to bring up Robert Sol, uh, one of Henrietta Sol's cousins who was an influential Zionist leader back in the US and one of the early uh, uh, Zionist uh, advocates in America at the time when most American Jews were anti-Zionists or non-Zionists. Um, this is something we covered in previous uh, sessions, but in case you did not attend any of the previous sessions, I just want to wrap up or summarize why the majority of American Jews were anti-Zionist or non-Zionist. Maybe someone wants, does anyone want to answer the question? Why was the majority of American Jews at this time anti-Zionist or non-Zionist? The majority of Jews in America were non-Zionist because number one, in 1859, the Zionist movement wasn't even a movement yet. So two, even when it became one, American Jews were extremely insecure. You know, 
they never really wanted to be. They always thought that that would mean that they would have two two uh, loyalties, and they would be accused of split, uh, you know, affiliation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, they were just, you know, given the fact that this was the first country they ever went to that they felt reasonably decent in. They didn't want anything to upset their security here. Yes, th thank you. Yeah, that, that that is absolutely correct. So the. First of all, the accusation of dual loyalism, what you also addressed, was definitely uh, one of the reasons um, why the majority rejected the idea of um, supporting a Jewish state in Palestine or moving or leaving uh, the United States. Um, there were also many who simply believed that uh, the melting pot will work and that they will be full and equal citizens in this new society to be created in the United States. Um, you might have heard the slogan, America is our Zion, uh, was a very popular motto of the reform movement in the 18th and 19th, early 19th century. Um, there are all these rabbinic declarations, especially from the 19th century, stating that Ju Ju Judaism is not a peoplehood anymore, that Ju Jews are not a, not a people, not an ethnicity, but just a religious community within the American people, within the American nation. So there are definitely all these tendencies, which goes against the Zion, which, which go against the Zionist interpretation of Jewishness, because Zionism, of course, believes that Juda Ju Judaism is also an ethnicity and that Jews are a people. Uh, besides being a religious group and besides having cultural traits, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, we are also the people according to Zionist tenets. So there, there was this contradiction between uh, the mainstream American understand American Jewish understanding of Jewishness and the Zionist understanding of Jewishness, which explains why the majority was non-Zionist or anti-Zionist. There, there is a difference here, but let's not take too much time. Uh, we're discussing that now. Uh, Henrietta Sold, you can you can see two pictures of her. Uh, the one on the top is from her high school graduation picture. Um, after graduating from high school, Sold taught at various high schools and also at Ohev Shalom at the, at her father's synagogue. Gave Bible classes not only for kids but also for adults and taught English for Russian Jewish immigrants. If you remember, we went through um, Russian Jewish immigrant experiences in the late 1800s in previous sessions. Uh, two million, about two million Jews immigrated from the Russian Empire to the United States between the late 1880s and 1921, uh, which is the largest wave of Jewish immigration in history two million people in just a few decades. Um, and of course, um, these Russian Jewish immigrants who just arrived in the US also needed courses to facilitate their integration into American society and Henry the Sold was involved in these efforts. Um, after her work as a teacher, she became editor in chief for the Jewish Publication Society in Philadelphia. Um, I'm, I'm sure that many of you are aware of this publication society. They are you know, very active until today and have been around for more than a century now. Um, she was responsible for translating works from German mostly, but also from French. Um, she was writing articles uh, for journals published by the society and also editing books, overseeing publication schedules. Now, um, there is one book in particular I want to emphasize. Um, she was the editor of Rabbi Marcus Jestro's the Dictionary of the Targumim, the Talmud Babli, and Yerushalmi, and the Midrashic Literature. If you ever go to rabbinical school, that it will be your best friend. That book is something you need to, <laughs> to graduate from rabbinical school because it's until, until today, that book is the most relevant uh, dictionary or that one of the most relevant dictionaries definitely uh, when it comes to um, Talmudic Hebrew and Aramaic. And for those of you who are in Pennsylvania, Marcus Jestro was the rabbi of uh, Rodef Shalom on Broad Street in Philadelphia. 
Um, yeah, so um, a reform, a reform temple. Right, and uh, even though she did not uh, graduate from university, you know, she, she I mean, Henrietta Sol was a woman and graduating as a woman in, in the late 1800s and early 1900s uh, was a challenge. She was not allowed. She was not, she was allowed to take, to attend courses, but not to take them for credit or not to, not to graduate. She was not allowed to graduate, uh, but she did attend public lectures and also courses at uh, Johns Hopkins and also at the Jewish Theological Seminary in Manhattan. Um, she recalled to have had feelings for one of her teachers, uh, Louis Ginsburg's name might be familiar to some of you. He was the he was a Talmudic scholar to, and he was also the editor of the book, The Legends of the Jews. Um, has has like I don't know a few volumes. It's it's a collection of uh, antique and early medieval, uh, mostly antique uh, rabbinic tales, midrashim. Yeah, but that relationship did not lead to was not fulfilled. Yeah, it was not mutual. Um, and she, she never, she never had uh, any other, as far as I know, relationships. Um, yeah, but apparently she hasn't, uh, didn't have any. Now, I promise you primary sources because I believe that uh, it's much more interesting to read primary sources than to listen to me speak for an hour. Uh, this is a letter that Henrietta sold wrote to a friend of hers, Chaim Peretz, in 1916, after Henrietta Solt's mother passed away, Sophia Schar passed, passed away. And in uh, Chaim Peretz made the offer um, to Henrietta Solt that he is going to say Kaddish for Henrietta Solt's loss. Uh, as you know, traditionally, women are not um, required or not permitted, depends on which tradition you read and follow, uh, to say Kaddish for a deceased parent or to anyone, basically. And Henrietta Sol's letter is something where, where she addresses this issue of tradition versus inclusion of women in the Jewish community. So if anyone would like to read her response to Chaim Peretz, I would appreciate that. Just feel free to unmute and read. I have it. I know well and appreciate what you say about the Jewish custom. And Jewish custom is very dear and sacred to me. And yet I cannot ask you to say Kaddish after my mother. The Kaddish means to me that the survivor publicly and markedly manifests his wish and intention to assume the relation to the Jewish community, which his parent had. And that so the chain of trans tradition remains unbroken from generation to generation, each adding its own link. You can do that for the generations of your family. I must do that for the generations of my family. I believe that the elimination of women from such duties was never intended by our law and custom. Women were freed from positive duties when they could not perform them, but not when they could. It was never intended that if they could perform them, their performance of them should not be considered as valuable and valid as when one of the male sex performed them. And of the Kaddish, I feel sure this is particularly true. Thank you, Joy. I wonder, how do you feel about, the, about her argument? And what do you think? How, how did high parents react? I don't know, because I, I don't know anything about high parents besides the fact that he was a good friend of Henrietta Sold. What do you think? How did he react? And how, what, what, what makes you think when you read or hear uh, Henrietta Sol's words about uh, 
women and Judaism and Jewish tradition? I want to say something if I can. Um, of course. I was in a similar situation when my mother passed away. And um, I, I, I'm probably closer to orthodox. Um, I'm between conservative and orthodox. But um, I, I couldn't accept what I was being told, you know, that I couldn't say Kaddish, especially that I couldn't say Kaddish without a minion. Mm. And um, quite to be quite honest, I just went my own way and I do what I feel is right. Yeah. So I really do identify with what you were saying. Thank you for sharing. I absolutely agree as well. It's one thing if something is performed differently in some different fashion, but there is no difference to me mm -hmm. speaking or mourning. And I think it's interesting that the her her emphasis on the original intention mm. was to relieve women because they had so much on them already that they didn't have to. That didn't mean they couldn't. Yeah. or wouldn't want to or would be able to. That, that's a good distinction. That's great, Jane. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. And going from what Jane says, it makes me think, um, as far as my understanding, the positive mitzvot that were time sensitive were the only ones that women had to be concerned about due to issues of being TMA. And it's like, I would hope that people would be able to get to a point of saying, if a woman says she is ceremonially clean at a spe specific point, that she should be trusted. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Um, I'm not so sure about her first statement. I mean, a hundred percent agreement with the second one. There's absolutely no reason in the world why women couldn't say that to their parents. And the fact of the matter is that in recent years, that's become recent decades, it's become completely acceptable. Even in many Orthodox synagogues, nobody even passed tonight. They set up a special section for the women. Most of Orthodox synagogues today have boards ready. If a woman walks in, she wants to say Kaddish, they'll set it up instantly. It's, it's already accepted practice. But the, the part about where she says that the purpose of saying Kaddish is the chain of tradition remains unbroken from generation to generation. It's, it's a great idea, but I don't think that's really what its purpose is at all. <laughs> In other words, it's, it's, it, 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 don't get me wrong. It's, it's, it's very inspiring to read somebody say something like that, okay? It's the kind of thing that really makes you feel, gives you a spiritual high. But it's, you know, that's not what the purpose is. The purpose is basically that a child has an obligation to the parents. And, and it's not to be the training tradition. It's the individual parent and that individual child. You know, it's, it's simply, you know, in other words, I, 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 here's a case where I find something very inspiring, but I don't think it's historically true. I don't think that's why Kaddish was instituted. Okay, so that, that, thank you for raising that point. I, th I think, I think um, so what you're saying is right from a halakhic perspective, right? The halakha, the halakha tells us you have to say Kaddish because, you know, it's a mitzvah. That, that's it, the end of the story. But, but there are agadic stories. There are moral uh, stories also in the Talmud and in Midrashim, which I was referring to earlier, uh, which actually do say that uh, if, if a child um says a kaddish says the kaddish after the passing of their parents that's a sign for a continuity and that's a sign that the child will remain jewish even though this big tragedy just happened in their life uh, that is not halacha of course this is not a halachic explanation it's an agadic explanation but but you know 
Agada and Halakha, they go together. They're both part of our tradition. Um, so you are right when you say that this is not the real reason, but there, it's a tradition. It's part of our tradition too. And, and thank you for raising that point. I didn't think about it, but it's, it's a very good point. Unless there are further comments, I, I would like to move on because I see it's already 1.30 and I have so many other slides to share with you. <laughs> so, um, at, at, this, at the same time as, uh, as being the editor in chief of the Jewish Publication Society, Henry Tessold also began to pursue Zionist activities uh, meaning she was involved in uh, the Federation of American Zionists, a representative body of the Zionist uh, activists of the age. And uh, you, she was the only woman in many of these circles and definitely the only woman leader. You can see a picture of, of her on the right side on the top, sitting at a table with a dozen male leaders of the Zionist movement and her being the only uh, a female leader at the table. Um, it was first in 1909 that she visited uh, Palestine and the Jewish community in mandatory Palestine. Um, I'm sorry, it was back then, not mandatory, in, in, in the Ottoman uh, Empire Palestine. And um, three years later, she founded Hadassah, co-founded Hadassah with six other uh, Jewish women in New York and served as president of Hadassah till 1926. Um, Hadassah was initially just a, a project where American Jewish women were sent uh, to Palestine to help the local population. Um, the first two nurses to Palestine were sent in 1913 and in the coming years, more and more nurses were sent to Palestine. Uh, by the end of the First World War, there were dozens of Hadassah nurses serving in Palestine, and later on, it became, you know, of course, hundreds and thousands. But that's, that's that that happened later, um, and also, especially in the 1920s, after the First World War, during the mandatory period, uh, Hadassah became engaged. The organization, the organization became engaged in founding hospitals, a medical school, uh, and all kinds of other facilities to that were promoting the welfare of all inhabitants of uh, the territory. I think it's important to emphasize that uh, Sold, I mean, Sold was a Zionist and her, uh, and she had a very strong vision of Jewish life in Palestine, but she and her projects, including Hadassah, were also available for non-Jewish inhabitants of the region. Um, and on the right side below, you can see the first class of graduating nurses uh, from Hadassah's medical school in 1921. Um, and I wanted to share with you two sources uh, from a speech that Salt delivered in the late 1800s in Baltimore. These two passages from her speech uh, indicate her vision of for Jewish people and the Hebrew language. Um, the, both of these, I mean, the, the speech was delivered before she had ever visited Palestine, but at this time she was already involved with Zionist organizations. And in this speech, she, yeah, I'm, I'm not telling you what she says. I will ask someone to read it. Let Henrietta Salt speak for herself. You don't need me to, for that. May I? Yes, please. Okay. If the Jew is to be transformed into a desirable member of society, it will come about by making him not the less, but the more a Jew, by leading him to concentrate his energy upon his particular inheritance, by having him do not what outsiders, friends, or foes would have him do, but what is forced upon him by the inevitable logic of his past, and having him do that better than anyone else can possibly do it. When that result is achieved, the Jew will be a cultured man and the Jewish people an indispensable link in the Federation of Nations allied for the work of civilization. 
Such development will be but another illustration of one of the primary truths of our civilization, the truth which by the student of organic nature is recognized as the specialization of function, which the industrial world is embodied in the accepted principle of division of labor, which in the political world has been exemplified in this century in the reawakening of Greece, the unification of Germany and Italy, and the development of the Danubian principles into the independent states. Through the consciousness living in each of its particular endowments, which in the moral and pedagogical world finally is a potent regulative in the form of self-respect. Thank you, Rachel. Um, not not the easiest text ever, but but I think it's very wise, and I th I think there's a lot to discuss here. So I wonder I wonder what are your impressions as you are reading or listening to Hendrik de Sol's speech that basically what what i get from what she's saying is that the best way for us to be leaders in our society is not to hide our jewishness but to emphasize that our jewishness is a part of what makes us especially capable of mm. doing what we do for society Great, love it, and and I, I think that's absolutely right. And and also, especially in a context of Jewish assimilation, I mentioned earlier the melting pot model, which was the ruling model of ethnic integration in the U.S. at this point. Um, and you know, in the melting pot, particular identities like the Jewish identity are threatened because it might disappear. Very often, it did disappear. And assimilation, of course, until today is a big challenge for our community. Um, and when I read uh, Sold, uh, to me, this is, this is a strong message against assimilation and in, empowers us to be Jews and to dare to be Jewish. So I think, Rachel, what you just said, that was absolutely correct. And it's like an early intersectionality where you have to you we cannot take away this influence on ourselves and should therefore be demonstrating it great great absolutely any other reflections If not, we can look at, we can, let, let's take a look at another passage from the same speech. Um, it's a logical continuity, continuity in nation, continuation of, of, of the first passage. To me at least, but maybe not to you. So would anyone like to read this other, this second passage from the speech? There is a vast literary storehouse filled with treasures. The key of the Hebrew language is in our guardianship. Have we a right to throw the key into the ocean of oblivion and deprive the world of the enjoyment of these treasures? More than that, when we have ceased to be the efficient guardians of our treasures, of what use are we in the world? I fear that in the case of such flagrant dereliction of duty, the 20th century will have in store for us not a ghetto, but a grave. At the seeming risk of confirming that Jews cannot be patriots and at the inevitable risk of calling down upon myself the imputation of narrowness, I assert my conviction that keeping in touch with our brethren is in itself an object. The Jew of Hamadan must be understood by the Jew of Paris and New York if Israel is to realize his mission. 
Dispersed as we, we have the best opportunity, even while proclaiming the unity and fatherhood of God, of serving as a practical illustration of the brotherhood of man. We prayed much about that brotherhood and in, and in demonstrating our willingness to be brother to any and every man, we put as a rule, we as a rule put an ever widening gulf between ourselves and the majority of our own race. So the anomalous condition has come about that we speak not only of Orthodox and Reform Judaism, but of American Judaism, German Judaism, and Russian Judaism as of wholly incongruous phases of development. As there is but one God, so there is but one Judaism, and that Judaism has but one language, the Hebrew. Thank you, Liz. So what are we doing, you know, speaking English the whole time? Not the whole time the services are in Hebrew, but, but still. I wonder what, what, what do you think when you're reading this? Well, Is really Hebrew our only language? I don't, well, we're all these dual citizens in different yeah. worlds. Mm -hmm. so, is, but it is a unifying factor. And I think in, in general, we need to be more reminded of the things that tie us together than pull us apart. Great, I love it. I was very Kaplanian of you to say that we are living in two civilizations. I've been paying attention. <laughs> I also think how, for those of us here in the United States, learning a, another language, being multilingual is often discouraged. Yeah. And so that that is one of those places as Jews that we uniquely have to work against the culture surrounding us. That is a very important point. Thank you, Joy. Yep. So are, are we doing enough to promote Hebrew? What do you think? <laughs> there, there, we, cannot, we, could, we could do more. I think we could do more. We are trying. We are trying. But we are not there yet. <laughs> so would anyone... Does anyone have any further reflections on these two passages on Jews as people and Hebrew as our people's national language or a language of identity, cultural language, however you want to define? If not, there is more. Let's let's go on. Let's go on then. Life in Palestine. So if you remember, uh, Sold had her first visit to Palestine in 1909, and after returning to the U.S., she established Hadassah. And in the 1920s, or beginning with the 1920s, she actually spent more time in Palestine than in the U.S. Uh, she uh, made a lot of effort of establishing the Hadassah Medical Organization. So suddenly it was just, it was not anymore just a program for American Jewish nurses to go to uh, the land of Israel and support the local population, but she established uh, a whole system um, which exists until today, uh, the Hadassah medical uh, system. In 1923, she co-founded the Hevra, which was uh, a reform conservative congregation in Jerusalem, the first one in history, together with Rabbi Judah Magnus, a reform uh, rabbi from San Francisco. Uh, we had a session on Judah Magnus before. In case you're interested, you can look it up uh, on YouTube, or Liz will put it in the chat box. I'll put in, I'll put it in the follow-up email. Great, thank you, Liz. Um, in 1927, she was elected to to the Palestine Zionist Executive, which was. A, a leadership organization that preceded the Sochnut or the Jewish Agency for Israel. And um, in 1933, uh, or starting with 1933, she uh, was co-running the Aliyah Tanoar, uh, Youth Aliyah, which rescued tens of thousands of Jewish children from 
Germany and uh, Austria after the Nazis rise to power. Uh, Salt herself visited um, Berlin and campaigned for youth alia. Um, and in 34, she co-founded the Hadassah Hospital in Jerusalem, which also exists until, until today. Um, And I brought you the, the, uh, some selected uh, statements and principles from the first publication of Hevra, of the Reform Conservative Synagogue in Jerusalem, which unfortunately didn't last for very long, um, lasted for a few months only, but it was the first. <laughs> and the members, so the members were only English, uh, British and, and American Jews, and they were basically uh, uh, American, following an Anglo-American subculture um, within the Jerusalem society, and they did not have uh, native Jerusalemites or native um, Jews, uh, Jerusalemite Jews in their congregation. They, and um, soon many members left Hebra. I mean, they were never a huge congregation. They were a, a Hebra, we, we would use the word today. They were just a Hebra, but all of them left eventually, and most of them joined and joined another uh, congregation called Yeshurun, which was Orthodox but modern Orthodox. Um, would anyone like to read the great principles of Hebra? This is not the whole uh, publication. I selected some of the principles which I thought were more relevant for our discussion today. So Sol was one of the co-founders of the Hebra. Again, that's her connection. Again. Jane, thank you. Respect for and as far as possible adherence to the Jewish tradition as to religious services. The Hevra will, however, give its own emphasis to this or to that part of the service. The complete conduct of the services is to be in the hands of members of the Hevra. It is not to be entrusted to professional readers, singers, or preachers. The complex equality of the sexes, the complete, equality of the sexes. This is to be expressed as far as possible within here. tradition. It's complex too, yeah. This is to be expressed as far as possible within tradition, but also in ways that the tradition has not provided for. The Hebrew language shall be the language of the services and the discourses, and the discourses. The general rule shall be better a, a poor Hebrew than none. The Hever will endeavor to point out the present day implications of the teachings of social justice and human brotherhood as inculcated by the Torah, the prophets, and the history of the Jewish people. In order to emphasize the brotherhood of Israel with all of humankind, appropriate selections from the religious literature of other peoples and religions shall find an appropriate place in a Hebrew translation either before or during or after the discourse. Thank you, Jane. Would anyone like to reflect on these great principles? It's pretty reconstructionist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I, I think you're right. Uh, I mean, you know, this is probably the zeitgeist, like right, like Mordecai Kaplan when he writes the first reconstructionist uh, articles. That happens in the same time, in the early 1920s. Um, and Henrietta Sol, I mean, I, I don't know if she knew Mordecai Kaplan in person, but they were definitely moving in sim similar circles. She studied at the Jewish Theological Seminary where Mordecai Kaplan was teaching. I don't know if she took any classes with Kaplan, but they were moving in the same circles. So if, if, this, if, the, if these statements remind you of Mordecai Kaplan, um, I think, yeah, I understand why you say that. Yeah. I understand why you say that. But at least maybe you want to elaborate for those of us who are not so who didn't come to previous lectures and are not so familiar with Kaplan. The emphasis on bringing in other religions, other thoughts that have value, the idea of that emphasis on teachings of social justice, our obligations towards the world we have. Um, 
Equality of the Sexes, 1923. Mm -hmm. And she's yep. 60 or so at this point, right? Yeah, yeah. She's so already 60. She's 60. kept moving with the times because. Yep. And uh, the idea of the Hever will, however, give its own emphasis to this or that part of the service. That what fits for that community is good for that community. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was great. I could not have summarized it better. I also love the formulation uh, that poor Hebrew is better than none. I, I will use it. I don't know what context, but I will definitely use it in the future. It made me think, uh, uh, well, the fact that I've been studying that entire time you've been running, I've gone from a biblical Hebrew app now to Duolingo with modern Hebrew. Great. Yeah. Uh, although I'm at translating you wear shoes into Hebrew and I'm like, why are they, there are so many words about wearing stuff. Too many of them, if you ask my English mind. <laughs> That's the, you know, a whole new world we will open up to you through learning a new language. So go for it. I think that's that's a good thing to do. Okay, so I will, I will suggest to move on because we don't have that much time left and there's still so much to talk about. But I really appreciate all your reflections. Um, and I think by reading these statements, I, we, you know, obviously we don't know if Henrietta sold herself wrote the, the statement, but she was one of the founders of the community. And one can assume that uh, she was comfortable with these statements because she stayed a member um, and was an active member in the Hevra, till the Hevra ceased to exist, as I mentioned before. Unfortunately, after a few months, a few months later than um, a few months after this was published, the great principles were published. So uh, last but not, not least, I promise you at the beginning that uh, towards the end of the session, we are going to uh, take a look at Henrietta Sold's political activism. Uh, she was first of all a supporter of a movement against an immediate Jewish statehood. So many, many, many Jews living in Palestine were afraid that if a Jewish state is to be established, uh, that will lead to conflict with uh, Palestinians and the neighboring uh, Arab populations. And for that reason, especially Jewish intellectuals, liberal intellectuals like uh, Sold, but also Judah Magnus, whom I mentioned before, and Martin Buber, Gershom Scholem, um, were organizing against the immediate establishment of a Jewish state. Um, and they were advocating for Jewish life in Palestine but they were, they were not advocating for the establishment of a Jewish state. And uh, in 1942, members or supporters of Brit Shalom established a political party, which was known as Ichud. Ichud in Hebrew means union. And this political party uh, was co-led by Henriette de Salt. She was serving on the executive committee of Ichud. And finally, I just wanted to read the declaration by Ichud. Um, again, just like the declaration of Hever, I don't know if Henrietta Sold wrote anything, but she was on the executive, executive committee of this party. And um, it is for this reason that I wanted to read this declaration by Ihud and maybe discuss how we relate to this declaration in a post-1948 world, in a world where there is a state of Israel, there is a Jewish state, so how do we relate to the vision of Henrietta Sold and her uh, com compatriots or co colleagues like Martin Buber and Judah Magnus? Do we have a volunteer to read the text? The, the, two, the three points are the most important ones, except for not so. It's okay if someone reads twice. <laughs> All 
I will. Thank you, Jane. The union is not at all anti is not at all an anti-Zionist organization. It is, however, opposed to the present policy of the official Zionist leadership in advocating the establishment of Palestine as a Jewish state. It is opposed equally to the establishment of Palestine as an Arab state. The declaration is as follows. The union adheres to A, the Zionist movement insofar as this seeks the establishment of a Jewish national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. B, the struggle throughout the world for a new order of international relations and a union of the peoples, large and small, for a life of freedom and justice without fear, oppression, and want. The union therefore regards a union between the Jewish and Arab peoples as essential for the upbuilding of Palestine and for meeting its basic problems. The union will strive for cooperation between the Jewish world and the Arab world in all branches of life social, cultural, and political, thus making for the revival of the whole Semitic world. The main political aims of the union are as follows. A government in Palestine based upon equal political rights for the two peoples. The adherence of the steadily growing Yishub and people to a federative union of Palestine and neighboring countries. This federation, federative union is to guarantee, is to guarantee the national rights of all the peoples within it. A covenant between the Federative Union and an Anglo-American Union, which is to be part of the future union of free peoples. This union of the free people for the establishment and stability of international relations in the new world after the war. Thank you, Jane. Yeah. A lot of a lot, a lot to discuss, a lot to digest too. <laughs> so we are just a couple of years before the establishment of the state of Israel. And Ehud was established in 1942, just after the so-called Biltmore Conference. Uh, the Biltmore Conference was the meeting of Zionist leaders where they finally <laughs> agreed to establish. Israel as a Jewish state. Till then, there was a division about it. But after the Biltmore Conference uh, in 1942, which was, of course, also in a context of you know the Second World War and, and the persecution of Jews in Europe, um, the, the absolute majority of the Zionist leadership aligned with the, with the idea of establishing a Jewish national state. And uh, Henrietta Sold's involvement in Ehud is a reaction to the Biltmore Conference. If anyone wants to reflect on uh, this declaration and what that makes you feel, I, I, I would be happy to you know, hear your reflections, but no, no pressure. Can I also move on? I, I got a video clip about Henry the Soul that I wanted to share at the end. So let's let's just watch it. Three, two, one. Okay. So Henry the Soul died uh, three years after uh, the establishment of uh, Ehud. She died in in the hospital, the Hadassah Rothschild Hospital in Jerusalem, which she co-established co or established, and was buried on the Mount of Olives. And finally, I just wanted to share a video produced by the Hadassah organization in 1946. Just a second. Here it is, almost there. Uh, can you see my screen? Okay, let me know if you can't hear the sound. There's no sound yet. ...of Hitler's Nuremberg proclamation, while stormtroopers guarded the doors, Henrietta Zold stood in a Berlin meeting hall. She had come in the name of Youth Aliyah, the youth immigration movement that had begun to move the menaced children of Europe to Palestine. She talked to men and women whose destinies were already measured in blood. She told them that their children would not die, 
Sorrowful Jews crowded around her, begging for news of boys and girls they'd sent to Palestine at the risk of their lives. They wanted to know if their sons and daughters were safe and well. Henrietta Zoll comforted each of them. Her face and voice were their only hope when nothing remained but terror. She went from there blessed by their gratitude. She knew that she would never see them again. Some of those children lived. The first boatload arrived at the port of Haifa in February 1934. There were 44 boys and girls facing a strange and frightening adventure. None was older than 17. They had left behind them the only friends they knew. Henrietta Zold met them at the harbor. In her presence, they found safety. In her eyes, they saw the eyes of the mothers they would not meet again in their lifetime. I should have had children, many children, Henrietta Zold had once told her friends. And here they were. gave them life and all that goes with a mother's gift. She was with them in joy and in sorrow. She shared their work and their play. Their celebrations were hers. Their victories were her reward. She asked no other. In 1935, she had stood before a Zionist Congress in Lucerne, reporting on youth Aliha. In that same year, she went to America. We have already brought out of Germany into Palestine a thousand boys and girls between the ages of 15 and 17. From a land in which they could not attend school, into a land in which they have fine educational opportunities from a land in which they cannot pursue trade, into a land in which they are taught trade, from a land in which they are repressed, into a land in which they are given the opportunity of full self-expression. Palestine is, in that respect, comparable to America, to the United States. As in the United States, our young people look forward to a life of usefulness, so in Palestine, these young people repressed in Germany are able to make for themselves a sphere of usefulness, a sphere of noble citizenship. So, thank you. Thank you all for uh, joining us today okay. to, to, to learn about Henrietta Sold, her life, and so whatever I'm going to say tonight is only from the Torah. Oh, I'm sorry. I was wondering what, what that noise was. No, it was <laughs> YouTube. They just kept playing another video. Um, so anyway, thank, thank you all for being here and for sharing your reflections and uh, experiences in connection with some of the sources, some of the speeches and right things and declarations that we were looking at. Um, that's all. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. I wish you a good new week, Shavuot Tov, and a good new month. Sivan is about to begin, so Chodesh Tov, and see you all soon again at events of Amhaskala. Thank you everyone for attending today. There'll be a follow-up email in the next day or two with a YouTube link. I've also put in uh, a link in the chat if you'd like to sign up for our emails or send a little donation as a thank you to the organization today. So everyone have a wonderful Sunday and take care.